everyone. If you could please first share your name, your pronouns, and how would you describe your work with plants? Thank you. My name is Leah Penniman. I am the co-founder and farm director of Soul Fire Farm in Mohegan Territory, Grafton, New York. I use all pronouns. And my work with plants is that of sacred kinship. I have felt, I was raised by plants and I have felt deeply accountable to plants for my entire life. I'm a farmer. So together with my team, we take care of 80 acres of land, raising plants using Afro-Indigenous methods that sequester carbon, increase biodiversity, care for the land, care for, care for our heritage. And then we share the harvest of the land with people who need it most in our community, those who are survivors of food apartheid. Amazing. And you said that you've always kind of quickly walked with the plants. Could you share an early memory that you had with plants that might have sparked this passion for farming? Absolutely. Well, I'll tell two briefly. Um, so one is my first relationship with cultivated plants was working in my grandmother, Brownie Lee McCullough's garden in blessed memory. Uh, she was a child of the great migration, having moved from the Rock Hill, South Carolina area where her family was on a farm that was a former plantation to the peri-urban areas of Boston, but she carried her agrarian tradition with her and kept a, a large, beautiful garden. So I would tend strawberries with her. And I, I was fascinated by the magic that is this ripe red, you know, incredible fruit that, that peeks out from under the leaves. So strawberries continue to be my favorite crop. But I'll mention preceding that, it was wild plants that I, I found kinship with. Our, our family was one of the only, sometimes the only family of color in our, our rural town in North Central Massachusetts growing up. And to say that the children at school were cruel would be an understatement. So we found solace in our siblinghood and we also found, found solace in the forest. It was the grandmother pine that we hugged and she you know, let us know that, that her sturdy trunk and her firm roots had our back and that we weren't alone. So that, that feeling of, of just deep, deeply being seen by the natural world started from, you know, from when we were in kindergarten as children. Oh, I love that so much. And I really relate to that too, as a black person who grew up in Kent, Connecticut, which was very white. Um, I also found a lot of solace in being in the forest, being around plants, um, in a place where you feel like no one is, can relate to you. So I love that the plants were there to support you during that time. And yes, strawberries are the best. <laughs> they are the best. We're transplanting some this week. I can't wait. I'm really excited. And I know Soul Fire Farm is a big team. Um, you said eight people right now. Is that correct? We actually have 12 people now. Oh. Some are part time. So it always depends how you count. But of everyone who lives, who works on the farm, about half of us live here. So this is our home, uh, as well as our job. This is our community of friendship and, and family, as we say, in addition to our coworkers. And then the other half of our team are doing equally important work, uh, but live in various places across the region and some even out of state. So doing a lot of the administration and logistics and online programming, you know, running our fellowship. So we, we have a, a beautiful team of 12. And just like we just completed this incredible uh, sanctuary classroom, which has a reciprocal roof made of these, these timber frame beams. Definitely check out our Instagram if you if this doesn't make sense to you with my description, but each of the beams supports each other in this circular spiral pattern, just like each member of our Soul Fire team and our extended community is part of an interconnected web of mutual support. Oh, that's amazing. And Soul Fire Farm was started by you and your sibling, right, in 2010? Was that how it was founded? So Soul Fire Farm was originally a family farm. It was started by my spouse, Jonah, and I, and our then little children who are now grown, uh, Nishima and Emmett, they were two and two weeks, respectively, two years and two weeks. And we were living in the south end of Albany, which is a neighborhood surviving food apartheid, historically redlined, uh, low income, majority black neighborhood. And we struggled, you know, to get fresh food for our family. There was no bus line to the supermarket, no um, farmer's market, no available community garden plots. And the only way we could get vegetables was to join a community supported agriculture, which is like a subscription program to a farm and walk over two miles to the pickup site. And when our neighbors found out that we knew how to farm and they were similarly struggling to access these ancestral whole foods, they, they started half jokingly uh, telling us, you know, when are you gonna start a farm? For us, when are you going to start feeding this community? Um, we didn't take that as a joke. We took that very seriously. And 
and wed ourselves to this land in 2007. Wow. Um, it took us, or 2006, we started building in 2007. It took us four years just to have the first building on the land. And my sister Naima has been involved since the beginning, you know, as a, a supporter, later as a facilitator. She's now a staff on the team um, and director level role. So yes, family. And also we've expanded to become a community farm. Uh, we have a co-op, nonprofit, you know, some other institutions to hold that, that community accountability. So it sounds like it really came from a point of real personal need uh, to having access to um, local food, organic food, but then also for your community. And is that s- still the mission? Do you, have you found that the mission has evolved over the years for Soul Fire Farm? Such a good question. So yes, and I mean, the first program that we started at Soul Fire Farm was called Solidarity Shares, which is a doorstep delivery program of fresh fruits, vegetables, uh, eggs, pastured protein, and other farm products at uh, pay what you can uh, arrangement. So with most of the folks paying nothing, you know, for the food, and then doing fundraising to support their their boxes. So every week, the food comes right to the door. It's the highest quality, organic, you know, wonderful uh, food to folks who otherwise would not have access. And that is our longest standing program. We continue to do solidarity shares. But yes, we have also expanded our mission in response to community need. You know, as the, the parents of, of these families receiving the food were saying, you know, there's no programs for the young people in the summer. Can you do something about that? Because they're getting harassed by the police or getting into trouble. So we started these youth programs and camps. And then we started having people reach out and be like, well, we're adults and we want to learn to farm because it's hard to find a culturally safe space uh, to be on land in these rural areas. You have apprenticeships, classes, you know, so we started a robust educational programming, uh, week-long immersions, uh, 18-month fellowship program. Then people started saying, well, now we know how to farm, you know, at least a bit, but we don't have any land, any capital, you know, what are we going to do about that? So we get involved in policy, we got involved in starting uh, land trust, uh, the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, supporting uh, a Northeast ecosystem, including capitalization vehicles. So, you know, it has grown and expanded because, of course, you know, as we went along, we realized it's not just about food in your belly. It's about food sovereignty, which is is having control and access to every aspect of the food system from land, you know, all the way to the plate. That's so beautiful. And I love that it's constantly building. It's like yeah, responding to your community, like, okay, we now know where to get the food. How do we grow it ourselves? Okay, now we need the land. How do we get the land? So it really is kind of beautiful how that evolution has grown in your response to your community. Um, Thank you for that. For sure. And I know you have, like you said, you have a team of 12 people. Uh, Do you oversee everything? Kind of what is your role in this community? Your oh, farm. sure. So, um, well, we all have a unique and important role. I am one of the co-executive directors along with Ife Kilimanjaro. Usually we have between two and three executive directors for our organization um, because we do work towards, you know, shared decision making and inclusive decision making. Um, so Ife is in charge of a lot of, the, you know, organizational policies and supervision and HR issues. I'm responsible for a lot of the on the ground farm management things. Um, as well as the narrative development. So hence me doing the public speaking and a lot of the writing. You know, I wrote this book, Farming While Black, which is a compendium of our curriculum. And then, you know, each team member has their own area where they're in charge, you know. So Danielle and Naima are out taking care of Soul Fire in the city. I don't have any, my hands aren't in that, you know. Cheryl's taking care of, you know, making sure our relationships with uh, our, our community are good, the communications, the donors, you know, and so... Cheryl's got that on lock, you know, Jonah and Kai build the buildings and fix them when they break, they got that on lock. So, you know, every team member has their area of uh, where they have power and control and responsibility. And and then we check in once a week and update each other and get input from one another in order to, you know, go forward with our plan. I love that because I feel like sometimes people are like, I want to start farming and it's definitely not a solo operation. Like you need- Oh no, please don't community. do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> at least at least two people to start. And that's still not enough. Like we've mm-hmm. definitely struggled uh, for the first several years just because we didn't have the resources to hire anybody, you know? So we were doing all the things. We'd be like, oh, the youth program's out here. Y'all just sit still. I'm going to go cook you lunch. I'll be right back, you know? Da, 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 da. So it's nice now to have, you know, a team that's more appropriately sized for, for the immense work that, that we all do. That's amazing. And you mentioned that uh, you wrote a book, Farming While Black, which I actually have right next to me. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I love Thank it so you. much. Um, 
can you share more about the book? Kind of what made you realize, okay, I need to kind of have this archival book sharing about this work and what's your intention behind it? Yeah. So first of all, I never thought of myself as a writer. I used to just do the blog for the farm and then Yes Magazine, which is this really cool publication that's focused on solutions. They liked the blog. So they said, oh, you want to write a few articles for us? Well, sure. Why not? I don't mind doing that. And it was fun. It was really fun. And um, a publishing company reached out later because they had read those articles and said, you know, if you ever want to write a book, but that just seemed so daunting, you know, like a book. But so what happened that made me change my mind is that, you know, as we were going through doing our programming, a lot of folks in our community um, wanted to join our fire immersion. It's the week long training, uh, you know, certificate in order to learn this Afro-Indigenous regenerative farming. And we just didn't have enough spots and the waiting list was getting longer and longer. So I was like, we have to figure out how to share this knowledge with our community because it's not out there. Like all the books that I had read on organic farming credited white folks, or they just omitted the history. Um, you know, you couldn't even find seed saving information for some of our heritage crops like sesame and okra would be just omitted from all the books. And, and, and we wanted to, you know, to get that information out there and not be gatekeepers. So started writing. It was, uh, I think the winter 2017 and it was delicious. It was actually the first winter that I loved mm. because I was not fighting winter by trying to make it into summer. I was doing what winter asked for, which is the in internal work, the introspection, the, um, the narration, the storytelling, you know, and, and it was my gift, you know, um, Toni Morrison said, if there is a book that you need to read that hasn't been written, go and write it. And it was a gift to my younger self as a teenager farming, going to all these conferences, not seeing any reflection of myself, yearning for that, questioning my belonging. I needed farming while black. And so my hope is that that becomes a gift for this rising generation of farmers to be like, oh no, we absolutely have a place. We've had a place here. This is our history. This is our work. We belong to the land just as much as any other people's belongs to the land. Oh, I love that. I love that so much. Really responding to what you wanted to see in the world and kind of putting that out there. So, and it's such an amazing book and such an important book. I really like see it as like an anthology. So, and I reference it a lot throughout when I get ready to do my own community gardening in the city. So thank you for putting it into the world. Um, and you talk a lot about Afro-Indigenous regenerative farming. For people who don't know, could you share what that is, what it looks like? I'm sure that's a big topic, so you don't have to go too much, but for people who just don't know. Absolutely. And it goes by many names. Some people call it Afroecology or heritage farming. You know, I try not to get too caught up in the semantics, but the point being that Black people all across the diaspora from the, the continent of Africa, you know, to the Caribbean, to Brazil have made immense contributions to our understanding of how to feed community without trashing the planet. Everything from the raised beds of the Ovambo people where fertility is concentrated and, uh, soil is allowed to have like proper drainage and we use raised beds all the time in our farm and our urban farms. Um, whether you want to talk about the African dark earth created by the women of Ghana and Liberia, where they combine ash and residues from soap making and cooking and, and the crops in order to make this super dark, rich compost that they add to the soil every year. So much so that you can determine the age of a community by the depth of the African dark earth that people have been adding to it. Right. Whether you want to talk about Dr. George Washington Carver, who is arguably the great grandfather of the modern organic movement, who out of Tuskegee University in Alabama in the late 1800s and early 1900s was pushing cover crop, crop rotation, compost, you know, all these technologies that at the time were seen as really wild and nonsensical. Like, how are you going to plant a crop just to feed the soil and not even eat it? That doesn't make sense, right? But he was saying, no, you ha we have to invest in our soil health first and foremost. Whether you talk about Mama Fannie Lou Hamer and the Freedom Farm Cooperatives or Mama Shirley Sherrod and, and the Land Trust. So these, these economic vehicles that are about sharing rather than competition. There's so many examples like that. And so when we talk about, you know, Afro-Indigenous regenerative farming, we're talking about a way of farming that actually improves the land and water and biodiversity, but that is rooted in a specific Black cultural context. Mm, amazing. So it's really tapping into our ancestral knowledge, what has always been done, what's continued to be done and kind of highlighting that. And, you know, when thinking about sustainability, 
I think for a long time, there's been a lens that this is something that white people do, or this is, you know, a white practice when truly it's not. And there is so many different ways in which black people have been doing this for many, many generations. Ashe, it is so true. And what a relief to learn that because I really had bought into the false story that black people's only relationship with the land was a couple hundred years of chattel slavery. Mm-hmm. Had not known about the 10,000 years of noble dignified relationship to the soil on the continent or all the things happening during the time of slavery or after around black people's relationship to land. So, so important to revise that history so our young people really understand that they belong and really understand that their ancestors have contributed in every generation to our knowledge about how to take care of the planet, who is not a commodity, but is a mother, a grandmother, yeah. an Arisha, an auntie, right? And so, so, um, and I'll mention that in, in West African cosmology, it is very important to underscore that, you know, whether you look at the Yoruba religion, whether you look at Vodun, whether you look at Akom, there is an understanding that the earth herself and also all of the components of earth, the streams, the trees, the rocks, they are Orisha, they are, they are deities. Um, and are to be revered in the spirit of ecological humility and are to be seen as, as elders to whom we defer. Um, and that underlying ethic, if it were to be adopted worldwide, would completely flip the way that we, we interact with plants and with, with nature as a whole, if we see them as our elders and not as some resource to be extracted. It's such an important message, such an important message. And oh my God, you're dropping so many amazing gems of information and stuff that I want to keep harping on, but I'm going to keep going. So thank <laughs> you. Um, at NYBG this summer, we're having an exhibition uh, around the table, exploring the foods that we eat and thinking about the cultural influence of our food ways, which you've already been talking about. Um, But in Soul Fire Farms work, do you have a specific food waste story? Are there certain seeds that you're saving, crops that you're growing to tap into your food waste story? Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I have to shout out Mama Ira Wallace of Southern Exposure Seeds, who's a Black elder seed keeper, and also Owen and Chris of True Love Seeds, because we were not saving much seed, you know, in the beginning. Garlic, Mm -hmm. because everyone saves garlic, but I was like, I don't understand. It's too complicated. There's isolation distances and hybrids. You know, it just seems like a lot. And they really convinced us that every farmer needs to be a seed keeper, um, which means you don't just save the seed, but you save the story. So we now do grow a lot of ancestral seeds. Uh, one of my favorite is the Plat Daisy tomato. It's a Haitian tomato. Um, we also grow a lot of kinds of okra and, and collard greens that are heritage crops um, in the Black community and then distribute those seeds via the True Love catalog. Um, but I think the one that I'll, I'll highlight now as far as food ways and sort of what's at the table, one of my favorite dishes that we enjoy together during every week-long immersion program is called soup jumu. Mm. So soup jumu is a Haitian dish. Uh, my maternal lineage is Haitian. And it commemorates a particular time in, in history. So what happened was during when, when the Haitian people were enslaved by the French, they were forced to harvest this the delectable pumpkin called the, called the jumu and serve it at the master's table, but they were not allowed to taste it. And in 1791, there was an uprising and the Haitian people armed with machetes and fire uh, went against the most powerful army in the world at that, that time. And they fought brutally, you know, for over a decade and were able to succeed in liberating themselves and creating the first free black nation, the first nation to outlaw slavery in the Western hemisphere. And they celebrated, of course, by making mountains of soup jumu because they could mm-hmm. finally eat this pumpkin. And so Haitian Independence Day is New Year. It's January 1st. So anytime you go to Haiti on January 1st, you will go see every house will have a giant pot of their own recipe of soup jumu. And you can go with a cup and go and sip and taste the different soups and the smell fills the air. Um, so there's so much in that story. There's the story. I mean, the jumu is a, you know, it's a native um, crop and there was a relationship between the Taino and, and the Black Haitians in terms of exchanging some of their seeds. So there's that. Um, but then also it, it's a dish of liberation. It's a dish of, um, of self-determination. And so, so that's meant a lot to us to share that food and the story that goes along with that food. Wow, that's incredible. I love it. Soup jamu. I want some now. And that <laughs> it really ties into what I was going to ask you next because the series is called Plants as Liberation. So thinking about liberation and the ways in which plants liberate you sounds like in so many different ways, but um, do you feel like plants liberate you? And if so, how? 
Oh my goodness. They absolutely do. They teach me, they liberate me, they encourage me to be my best self. I mean, I'm thinking right now about um, this one particular maze. Um, it's a, a monthly black maze that I can't even describe in words the honor that it is to re to have received these maize seeds from uh, Warren in the, at the Mohican Nation Reservation in in Wisconsin, and this is a, a seed that they've been saving for millennia that struggles to reach its full maturity in the limited light of the latitude that they're at, and is much happier in the homelands, you know, of eastern New York, where the Mohican people were forcibly removed in the 1800s onto this reservation. And there's a lot to say about uh, the, you know, the incredible injustice that is that removal and that attempted genocide. But they gifted us this corn to come back home. And so we plant the corn in the way that Warren instructed us, you know, in the particular mounds and the, with the sunflowers, with the beans, with the squash. So it's together with its sisters. And there's something liberating about that return to homeland, being in solidarity. Um, I do have native ancestry, but it's Taino and Cherokee. It's not Mohican. So I'm in solidarity with the Mohican nation as someone who lives on these territories mm -hmm. um, and tries to honor that. And seeing this maze come home to be reunited with its sisters, to be reuni reunited on the land, is it swells my heart. And it makes me think about um, the possibility, like that we can hold out possibility for all of us who've been displaced, who haven't been able to own land because 98% of the agricultural land in this country is white owned or have housing security, that there is a potential for homecoming, for reunification with family, and that these plants you know, can show us the way to do that with, with grace. Um, and with solidity. That's a beautiful metaphor and story to follow, just like the, just the way in which we, we've been displaced, certain crops and seeds have also been, but the fact that it can grow so successfully in the area that it's indigenous to is incredible. I really love that. Um, do you have any tips and advice for young people wanting to get into farming? I know you shared you have certain programs for young people. Um, but maybe those who aren't in your area that could benefit from them. Uh, what, oh, absolutely. What tips do you have? Well, I would say just get started. I mean, the earth loves you back and the earth has been missing the bare feet and laughter of her grandchildren. And there are so many ways, like if there's a community garden in your neighborhood, you can go volunteer, get a plot. If there's an elder in your neighborhood who has a garden, offer to help them. If your school has a garden, you know, get involved with that. But even if you don't have access to those community resources, you can start a tiny garden right in your house. Find the sunniest window, ideally south-facing, but east or west can be okay too, as long as it's not shady. And you can get some, you know, old expired seed, if that's all you can get, of any type of greens, like lettuce, kale, radishes, and just sprinkle it on some soil, keep it watered, and you're going to get microgreens. Mm -hmm. Or you can grow sprouts in a jar. And just the magic of watching those things grow, you're going to get hooked. You'll be hooked and you'll be like, mom, dad, you know, can I put some on the fire escape? I know that's illegal, but can I, can I put some, you know, pot or can I get a community garden plot? And it's just going to grow and grow and grow. You know, um, one of my farm mentors who I, I worked with for many years, every year she would say, oh, next year I'm going to cut back. This is really too much. And every year she'd expand her farm and we're, we are guilty also. <laughs> that's <the> same thing. <laughs> so go for it, get hooked on life. That's what I recommend. Yes, I'm a big supporter of someone in New York City of the windowsill garden. So definitely, I recommend that. There's so much you can do with just your windowsill. Um, if, this is probably going to be a tough question, but if you could be a plant, what plant would you be and why? Oh, I could be a plant. Well, the survivalist in me is like, make me algae or something because I'm going to be around for a long, long time. <laughs> but I will say that the plants that I admire most um, is the white pine, Pinus strobus, is the white pine. It is, it is the, um, the giver of the forest. It's the one that's able to photosynthesize the longest and share its sugars and minerals with all the other trees in the forest to provide, uh, wh when the great pine dies, it offers up its body as a nurse log in a way that is unique among species. And so I aspire to embody that generosity um, and that majesty as well. So I would be try to be a white pine if she would let me join her. <laughs> <laughs> I love white pine too. I'm sure she will. <laughs> uh, do you have any upcoming projects or 
programs you want to highlight that you want to let people know are coming up? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, so first of all, if you go to soulfirefarm.org or follow us on Instagram at soulfirefarm, you're going to see all this and more. You're also more than welcome to join any of our online programs. We have volunteer days every other week and tours every month. So if you can get here physically, you know, please do um, sign up for one of those events. And we would love to meet you and break bread with you and, you know, just get to know one another. Amazing. Thank you so much, Leah, for your time today. We really appreciate you sharing uh, your work with Stole Fire from us and just your story. It's been so impactful. Thank you. It's such an honor to be with you. <laughs>